41 through 51. And your pew Bible is 755. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You may be seated. Sometimes as we read through the lessons, we kind of wonder what one has to do with the other. And I at first thought that about 1 Kings. It's like, well, what does that have to do with John 6? John 6, of course, is the bread of life chapter. Jesus fed the 5,000 and then explained to the crowd why he was the bread of life. And, uh, but uh, in, Eli in 1 Kings 19, we have the story of Elijah fleeing from the threats of Queen Jezebel. And he lay down and took a nap, and then an angel woke him up and said, Get up and eat. And then he took another nap, and then he woke up again, and then the angel had him eat some more. And I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes through my life I've had trouble maintaining my weight. It always wants to go up, you know. It just kind of naturally does that. I remember one time we decided, well, this was years ago when we were still on the farm, we decided we need to lose some weight. So being members of Shackley, we decided, let's try the Shackley diet plan. And it works. It's a good plan. But uh, we, we were on that and losing about a pound a day for the first week. And that was great. You know, we're getting all trim and our clothes fit real good again. They weren't so tight. And we went up to Independence Center, which is what we like to do on Friday night sometimes. Went to the mall and kind of goofed around. Well, in the food court, there's a place called Winchell's Donuts. You know, you can go to that place and look at a donut and gain a pound and that's about what happened I guess maybe we ate one but you know one donut for the whole week and it screwed up the whole diet so it's like well you know it's so Elijah eats two meals punctuated by a nap and that gives him strength to go 40 days on a trip it's like man I'd like to get some of that kind of bread and that sounds like a good diet but I'm not here to talk about dieting I want to talk about John 6, the uh, bread of life, and that is the, basically our underlying theme this month, really. Uh, but as I was reading through John 6, not just the verses of, for today's text, I noted how many times the Jews were questioning Jesus. And so, as is the case so often in John's Gospel, Jesus does a miracle and then follows a lengthy discussion. Now, Jesus has to explain himself explains what he did, and that's what's going on here. And so that's what I want to look at is the questions particularly that the uh, people asked of Jesus. Uh, what does the world want of Jesus? Okay, that's the theme for today. What does the world want of Jesus? And, of course, what does Jesus offer is the uh, counterpoint to that. First of all, in John 6, verse 25, if you'd like to look at that, when they found him... On the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? He had just fed the 5,000, and then he disappeared. You know, the next day he was gone, he was someplace else, and the crowd was still looking for him, and they finally found him. And so they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? The world looks for material blessings from God. 
Jesus knew that's what they were looking for. He said in the next verse, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. And God wants, of course, to take care of us. God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to enjoy the blessings he gives us. And it's not bad if we're sick to look for healing. The crowd, of course, they, they came to Jesus for healing. They happened to be there all day without food, and Jesus fed them, acting as the good shepherd, but to show them that he was the Lord of all. But all they could think about was the material blessings, and that's why they followed him. Kind of reminds us of the parable of the rich fool. That's all he had in mind was the pleasures of this life, the blessings that he could get and enjoy. God does want to bless us. He wants us to be happy. The Bible even says that. We don't have to just get it out of some obscure place or some teaching. Everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. God wants us to be happy. But that should not be our pursuit. Our pursuit should not be the things of this world. Our pursuit should not be food and drink and pleasure. We can learn that much from Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. Meaningless, another translation has, has it. And Solomon, uh, being as the wisest man of all time, he decided to test it out to see what pursuits he could do. And he pursued it all, and he gained it all. And he found out it wasn't worth the time. The pursuit of all earthly things, vanity, everything is meaningless. In Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, he wrote this, that um, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This, too, is meaningless. And in 23, uh, Proverbs 23, again written by Solomon, he said, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. The things of this earth won't satisfy, and if they do, it's a short-lived satisfaction. If that's what we base our life on, we'll be disappointed at some point. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. But the things are not what we seek. The Lord is what we seek. The world looks for material blessings. God gives us all things, but most of all, he offers us himself. Going back to John chapter 6, then the next question that the people had of Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? And here we're reminded the world wants to save itself with God's approval. What must we do? We can do all sorts of things, and lots of us do do a lot of things, but the question is why do we do them? Do we do them so that we can get to heaven and be saved? Or we do we do them because we want to represent God and his love to the world? We can do all sorts of things, but we're born spiritually dead. Those of us who have gone through Ephesians, we've studied that on Wednesday nights this year. And that is one point that Paul makes over and over again. We're dead spiritually. We have no life by birth. We cannot save ourselves. Therefore, if we depend on what we do, we're depending on dead works. The Bible says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. We can't do enough. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Luther was a monk of monks. Their behavior was flawless. And, and every little sin, every little thought, every little word that escaped their lips, they confessed. But they knew it wasn't enough. They're, they stood guilty before demanding God. 
But what did Jesus say? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. That's our thing. God's work is to save. Our work is to believe. Many people's favorite verse and the verse that we probably learned first of all, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What must we do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't make the same mistake of the world wanting to save itself and have God put his stamp of approval on your actions. Jesus gave that answer to believe, and, and the next question comes in verse 30. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Which I find is one of the most curious questions in the whole Bible. He just fed 5,000 of them with five loaves and two fishes, and they wanted to see a miracle. Talk about ingratitude. Talk about stupidity. What will you do? But from that, I determined that the world wants to see a sign today. The world wants to order God around. They know God can do miracles. They know God can do whatever He wants to, but they want Him to prove it to them personally. They want God to fulfill their will, not God's will. And they may pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done, but what they really want is, My will be done, whenever you get around to it, God, preferably sooner. Do for me whatever I ask of you. But the Bible instructs us, what more can God do? God already sent Jesus Christ to be our Savior. God's love is shown for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes to great lengths to show that Christ has already risen from the dead. What more do we really want him to do that he hasn't already done? What more does he need to do to save us, to give us all things? What will you do? What more can he do than take the sins of the world upon himself. What more can he do than conquer death than what he has already done? The world wants Jesus to do their bidding. Jesus has already done more than we can ever ask or think or imagine. Jesus went on to explain how it wasn't Moses, it wasn't manna that saved the Israelites in the desert, but it was God. And he talked about bread that gives eternal life. And, and the crowd said in verse 34, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. What they really wanted, give us a king who will provide us for security for our whole life long. The world wants eternal security that they can see. I read a poem, and I really can't quote the whole thing, but it's kind of like you can buy insurance, but you can't buy security. You can buy uh, health care, but you can't buy good health. You can buy uh, food, but you can't buy satisfaction. And so it goes on and on. Money's useful for lots of things. Security is one of those things that people crave. But we want to be able to see it, to feel it, to touch it, to know that we have it by the things that we have. Give us this bread. In John 17, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus said, I have kept them safe from the world. Jesus keeps us safe. He gives us everything that we need to keep us from the world, from the devil, from sin. Jesus gives a life that cannot be shaken. Haggai chapter 2, he said, Yet once more the world will be shaken and everything in it. But I found a verse in Psalm 62 which has become very meaningful to me. Psalm 62 verse 2 says this. I'll read verse 1 also. My soul finds rest 
in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Another version says, I will not be greatly shaken. In God, we have perfect security. Nothing is going to happen to you that God doesn't know about. Nothing is going to happen to you that can overcome you. Nothing is going to happen to you that will take away your salvation, that will take away God's love, that will take away eternal life. Do bad things happen sometimes? Yes, of course they do. We live in a world that's not perfect. You know, some people ask, in fact, it's a great obstruction to their faith. If God is good, if God is loving, why doesn't He do something about all the evil in the world? He did. He sent Christ to be our Savior. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. He rose Him up from the dead. And guess what? Heaven is a perfect place. This world isn't. Why do we expect this world to be perfect? God's moving us toward the next one, which is perfect. If we want security, rest in God, our mighty fortress, our eternal salvation. So if we want security, come to Christ. Jesus went on to explain in answer to that question of for security. Verse 40, he said, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, being himself, and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And their next question, the next part of the conversation, verse 41. At this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? They began to grumble about him. And so the world wants to worship self and not God. We know who Jesus is. We saw him grow up. We know him from a little boy. He's a person. He's a carpenter. And they really verbalized what they really wanted to say in John chapter 10. We're not stoning you for any of these miracles, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. How can Jesus, the carpenter, how can Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, be God? Jesus was crystal clear in John 6. He knew, they knew he was saying, he was offering himself as Lord and Savior. They knew he was giving himself as the bread of life. They knew he was equating himself as the Lord who carried the Israelites through the wilderness under Moses. They got that. But they, they couldn't understand how Jesus could be God. And you know what? They're right. How can a mere man be God? And many modern people make the same mistake. They ask the same question. How can a man who lived in 30 AD, or any other time for that matter, be God? And in a sense, they're right. No man can be God. No angel, no demon, no spirit. No created being could ever be God. And Satan tried it. He's more powerful than any of us. You know, we, we read through history and there's all these names that stand out. Men among men. Cyrus the Great. Nebuchadnezzar. Alexander the Great. Julius Caesar. Uh, and coming down to more modern times, Napoleon and, and Hitler. And, and these guys were, you know, they moved the world. But they have just an iota of the power of Satan, the highest created being, the guardian angel in the Garden of Eden. And he tried to be God, and he failed. No one can be God. And so, in a sense, their question was legitimate, but they're asking the wrong question. Instead of asking how a man can be God, they should be asking, what is God doing? God became a man. 
No man can be God, but God could and did become a man. And he became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah, the prophet, talks about uh, in the Lord's eyes. The Lord looked around. He was looking for salvation. He was looking for a way to save his people. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. God did it himself. No man could save Israel. No man could save Gentiles who trusted in him. And so God did it himself. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. To all who believed in Him, He gave the right to become children of God. No man can become God, but God became a man in order to save us. And we move on to John chapter 6, verse 52. Jesus went on in answer to their previous question to again claim that he was the bread of life. And then he begins to become even more specific. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, which is his flesh, he would live forever. And so in verse 52, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? The world wants to be able to explain religion. The world wants to be able to understand all the things of the Spirit, to, to worship what it can see, to understand what God's doing, essentially to be in control. But God is beyond understanding. I mean, it's kind of by definition, really. If we could understand God, we would be God. But how can there be more than one God? It just doesn't make any logical sense. God is beyond understanding. The world wants to explain things and to understand all things. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And I can see two different uh, ways of looking at that. How can a man give us his flesh to eat? The Psalm, uh, Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so in a sense, Jesus is talking symbolically, in a sense. In Deuteronomy 16, uh, Moses talks about the bread of affliction that the Israelites suffered. Did they eat sour bread? No. He was talking about slavery, a terrible experience. It was bitter. It was hard. It was tough. It was fatal for many people. The bread of affliction, they suffered. Psalm 80, verse 5, talks about the bread of tears. It was a mournful thing to be in slavery. It was a mournful thing when Israelites were conquered. Isaiah 48, 10 talks about the furnace of affliction that God put the Israelites through. Did they march into a, a furnace? No. Well, three did, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the rest of them, no, they didn't go into a furnace. It meant they were tested and sorely tried. And so sometimes we get language in the Bible that is getting us, you know, to look past our imagination and past the literal meaning to the words to what God is really wanting. Uh, one version says, find out for yourself how good the Lord is rather than taste and see the Lord is good. Or discover for yourself that the Lord is kind. Experience God for yourself. That's what Jesus wants, to eat of his body to take him into ourselves, to become so intimate with him that we are one together at the same time. But there is another sense in which Jesus wanted to answer that question, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And of course, that's through Holy Communion. But the question, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? We could come right back and say, how could he feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish? 
How could he feed 4,000 with seven loaves and a few small fish? How could he feed Israel in the desert for 40 years? How could he turn water into wine? If Jesus did all these things and more, and particularly if he could multiply loaves and fish to feed a multitude, can he not multiply himself to feed those who follow him? Should be a small thing. Of course he can, because the Bible says with God, nothing is impossible. But could he not have made another way besides faith to enter heaven? I mean, all this sounds kind of silly. Just believe we don't have to do anything. And then he wants us to repent and be baptized and get pour water on your head and eat bread and wine, and that's how we get forgiveness? The world doesn't like that. It sounds all too simple. And besides that, you know, we don't identify with blood anymore. We're modern people. We're beyond all that tribal picture language. But God's word is eternal. The soul that sins shall die. His blood I shall require upon him. And so it's the blood of Jesus and only the blood of Jesus that forgives us of our sins, that pays the price. The world wants peace, but cannot have it because it refuses to accept God's kind and gracious offer. We just got back from vacation Monday night. And I'll have to tell you what happened Saturday. Katura was in the uh, a Civil War reenactment. She's done a lot of things I never would have thought about, but one of them is getting into reenacting now. And uh, she's got a, she was, hold me back now, she was Confederate. She had on the gray, but she was a fifer in the Confederate ranks. And uh, it was a great, it was a good little reenactment. We enjoyed it. And then afterwards, she had found out that uh, this author, Jeff Shara, all these books about the Civil War, well, not just the Civil War, American Wars generally, he's written all those. And he was doing a book signing at a bookstore in Gettysburg. We thought, well, you know, there's probably a long line. We've got to drive two hours back to where we were staying in Washington. But we can at least swing by there, and, well, maybe we'll get a chance to say hi and get his autograph or something. Well, we walked over there. We went, up, we went into town, and we went to, into the store where Jeff Shara was. And lo and behold, there wasn't a soul in the room. Just Jeff and a table piled full of his books. And so we got to spend about a quarter of an hour just talking and having a good old time with Jeff Shara, one of our favorite authors in the whole world. And you know, I thought every single day when we come before God, we don't have a chance just to simply read a book that we like. We get to meet the author of the book. He gives himself to us day by day. He gives himself to us in communion, in scriptures, and in prayer. We can spend all the time that we want. Even if we're driving two hours to get to bed that night, we can drive with the Lord Jesus, the author of the book. That's what Jesus was offering the Israelites in John 6. Himself. And he makes the same offer to us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come to me, all you who are weary and, and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me and have life. That's Jesus' offer to us. Experience him for yourself, as the Lord promised in Isaiah 49, verse 23. You will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, not only for the creation of the whole world, the, the stars in the universe, the awesome wonders of all creation which cause us to fall down in worship. Thank you not only for daily 
moment by moment giving us life. The air we breathe, the food and drink that we consume that gives us energy and strength. The friends, the communities in which we live, the activities we get to do that make our life rich and full. But all of this pales in comparison with what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Not only do we gain life through him, but eternal life, forgiveness for all our sins, the hope of eternal life and resurrection, immortality in that city of gold coming down from heaven unto the new earth. You have done so much for us and oftentimes we just kind of forget about it or we move merrily along, but cause us to be ever grateful, ever full of thanksgiving. Remind us that you want to spend each and every moment of every day with us. And I pray, Lord, that as we have needs, as needs arise, that you will be with us, cause us to come to you first, to include you in our hearts, in our lives, in the daily moments that come before us, that you are our Lord, not only of our confession, but of our hearts and our minds. Help us to experience you for ourselves in all your riches, in all your glory, that we might grow into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing our